stand together for the reading of the scripture. Uh, I'll be reading from John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, and verse 27. I am the good shepherd. That's Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Father, we come together to the sheep fold. We come as your sheep. We come grateful for the shepherd who leads us. And today, Father, we want to learn how to listen as sheep. Speak to us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Many of you know that a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I uh, used to teach in a Bible college until I uh, got retarded, I mean retired. And uh, those of you who have known that have asked me on occasion, what is it that I taught? Well, I taught primarily in the field of ministry, how to do ministry, how to be a, a pastor or a teacher within a church. And I also taught psychology classes. Well, I only tell you this to give you some background so you understand where I'm going for the next few minutes. One of the classes that I taught was Introduction to Marriage and Family. It would be a class that was uh, beneficial for ministers and beneficial for the students because most of them were going to what? Get married, have families. And so we wanted them to come out of that with a good Christian understanding of marriage and family. So I would have my uh, students read a chapter on communication uh, by Howard and Charlotte Kleinbell. They were a married couple who were also marriage counselors, and they were considered experts in this. And in their book, uh, on, excuse me, in their chapter on communication, uh, it was a great chapter, but all I really wanted my students to read was the first three sentences. But I assigned the whole chapter anyway. You know, because you don't want to waste a good chapter, right? So I had to read the whole thing. But here's what the Kleinbell said in their opening statement about communication and marriage. And so part of this, you're going to go, okay, yeah, yeah. So listen up. Communication is the means or the way that human beings relate to one another. No. Okay. No communication, no relationship, right? Okay. In order to play basketball, you have to have a basketball. Okay, you gotta have a hoop. Alright? Doesn't matter if you got a court or not, you can make anything into a court, but you gotta have a basketball and you gotta have a hoop. You gotta have something to shoot at. Well in communication you know, you've got to be able to talk and listen in order to relate. Now, it's a job, but I can't tell you how many times in the counseling room I heard people say, we just can't communicate, and we don't understand why we don't get along. You can't communicate, you can't relate. Here's the second thing they said. This is not going to bowl you over, you know. They said communication determines if the relationship will be established, whether it continues or whether it be terminated. Okay. If we're communicating, you're gonna you're gonna run to the exit, right? So you know it, it has a determination on whether the relationship will continue. <laughs> and then the quality of communication determines the quality of the relationship. All right. And then they say communication is the in instrument of a 
achieving mutual understanding, which they say is at the heart of marital intimacy. Without mutual understanding, there's not going to be any real intimacy. The Kleinbells also talked about a listening skill that everybody needed. They called it deep listening. Now this deep listening, by being able to listen to that individual and see the world through their eyes so that you could understand why they're thinking or feeling or acting as they do. So it's, you know, walking a mile in somebody else's moccasins, so to speak. Now I want you to keep that thought about deep listening, being able to see from another person's perspective kind of right up here in your memory. So if you would insert your disc, hit save, okay, because we're going to come back to that multiple times. Now, some of you are wondering what all this has to do with the scripture I read. What does this talk about marital communication and the scripture have to do with prayer? After all, the title of the sermon, I am convinced I want to get prayed up. Now what? Which seemed to indicate that the sermon is going to be on prayer, right? So what is it that this talk about communication, the talk about Jesus as a good shepherd, have to do with prayer? Now to help you deal with your wonderment, I have to take you back last week for just a quick moment. Last week, um, we discussed the uh, a phrase that I heard growing up in my church. Older Christians would, could be heard, you know, talking about, are you all prayed up? Now what they were talking about in being all prayed up was it that are you ready for the spiritual battle that looms on the horizon? And we discussed last week that the recent Supreme Court decisions um, are an indication that spiritual battles are on the horizon. Not everybody was pleased. We as Christians were pleased by those, but not everybody is. And so we already know that the battle has started. And so the so what moment of the sermon last week was, are you ready? Are you ready to get prayed up? So if that's I'm hoping that as you come to our service today, you're thinking along these lines. I'm convinced. I want to be prayed up. And I want to know what's next. How do I go about getting all prayed up? Well, if that's you, then you're ready to understand the goal for our service together today. I want you to understand and value the role that listening plays in your prayer life. I want you to understand and value the role that listening plays in your prayer life and getting all prayed up. Now the reason why I link those together is this. If you can't understand, you're not going to attach any value to it. And if you can't attach value to it, you aren't going to do it. Okay? So I want you to stay with me and understand so that you can value and then utilize listening in your prayer life. So that's going to be kind of the so what moment. Now, here are the things we're going to do to get to our goal. The first thing we're going to do is explore the role that listening plays in our relationship with Jesus. Then we're going to explore why listening as we pray really matters. Okay, I'm going to tell, I, was, I was wrestling here, having a little wrestling match, when I tell you. You know, most of the time when a professor says we're going to have a pop quiz, he just pops it out. I'm just telling you now, there's going to be a pop quiz. So, for those of you who get nervous about quizzes, let your heart start embracing. Okay. No, no, take a deep breath. It's one question and it's absolutely easy. Okay? So, we're going to talk about why listening matters in prayer, and then we're going
we're going to arrive at what we call the so what moment. That moment of decision. Now you can, as you look at the goal and you look at the step we're going to talk about, you figure the so what moment can have something to do with listening, right? Okay, I, I need you to start talking. Okay, uh, because you're going to talk in a minute. Okay, all right. So, we're ready now for step one. We're going to understand the role of listening in our relationship with Jesus. So I want you to look, first of all, at the scripture once again, and I want you to notice the words that are emphasized. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I want to take a moment, as we open up that scripture, look at the big picture for just a moment. And so there should be a stop. There it is. You see the picture? Familiar picture to many of us, right? Jesus with the sheep. This is a visual representation of the verbal picture that Jesus is painting, where he states, I am the good shepherd. Now what I want you to notice is that he does not say, I am a good shepherd. He says with a definitive tone, I am the good shepherd. Then he backs it up. He doesn't just say, I am the good shepherd. He gives us evidence that he's the good shepherd. He talks about the fact that the sheep, that he knows the sheep. And the sheep know him. There's this connection. There's this communication. You can't know without understanding. Now, this is a familiar picture. It's a comforting picture. But I don't want you to miss the point of this picture. The picture is not whispering to us. That was my Joe Biden moment. <laughs> He's not saying, I'm the good shepherd. He is loudly thundering the message, I am the good shepherd. Now, the point of the picture is this, is that it's not that we know Jesus, and that he is just merely aware of us. It starts out by proclaiming, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep. He's taking the initiative to know us, to understand us, and then we in response come to know him. So the picture communicates that Jesus knows us. And knowing someone, especially coming to know them well, does not just happen. Right? Okay. Jesus, by saying he knows his sheep, is saying that he is, catch this, he's doing this, he's investing time and energy in knowing us. I'm quiet for a moment to give you just a little time to cogitate. To think about what I just said that he is investing time and energy in the present tense in knowing us. Now that's a good and comforting thought, but the exciting statement is the next statement. He's telling us how well he knows us. He knows us as well as he knows the Father, and the Father knows him. This knowledge is not just a cursory knowledge. 
It is a deep, deep knowing. Now, this is a great picture of our relationship with Jesus. The picture of our relationship is that he is the good shepherd who knows his sheep, his sheep know him. And the picture that you looked at is a picture you're familiar with. But don't let the familiarity help cause you to miss the role of listening in the relationship. Remember, what we're trying to do is explore why listening matters in our relationship with Jesus. We're going to soon see that listening is a vital part of the relationship. Jesus even said in verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice. Because we listen, we come to know, and because we come to know, we start to follow. We follow him as the good shepherd. So I want to take a moment and start looking at the individual brush strokes, if you would, of the picture. I want us to kind of dig down into the details. Now that we've got the big picture, we see it. I want to see what the details are so that we can start to develop this sense of appreciation for listening. Now, you know well that throughout the Bible that there are images of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There's the father-child relationship. There is the shepherd-sheep relationship. Now, I lost my place. That's terrible. Okay. Uh, uh, there it is. That's where I'm supposed to be. So what I want us to, to understand is, is that these two images, father-child, shepherd-sheep, require that both parties in the relationship are working. The shepherd-sheep relationship is a working relationship and not a magical relationship. <coughs> now by that I mean that both the sheep and the shepherd have to work to create the, the relationship. Sheep listen to the shepherd. Sheep follow where the shepherd leads. And at the same time, the shepherd is listening to the sheep. The shepherd is listening for sounds of pleasure, sounds of distress. The shepherd is also listening to the environment and looking for threatening sounds out there in the environment because Jesus has already said he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. So as the good shepherd, he is listening to us. Now, I'd like for you to just take a moment and gaze on the intricacy of that idea. Our relationship with Jesus does not just happen. Nor does our relationship with Jesus depend solely on us. I need you to listen slowly, because you can think faster than I can talk. <laughs> but I want you to stay with me. As the shepherd, he expects that the sheep will listen to his voice. He wants us to listen so that we can develop trust in his leadership, and that we will willingly follow him. But Jesus, as the good shepherd, is also working hard so that he can know us. Now, we get it that we have to work at it, okay? But listen, so you don't miss this, that uh, Jesus is working as hard on our relationship as we are, perhaps even more so. Are you thinking, wait a minute, Jesus is God, right? He 
he's already done all the work, hasn't he? We all would just celebrate it. The Lord's Supper, in which we remember the cross and the tomb. He died, and he rose again. What more work does Jesus have to do? And Jesus is God, right? So that means he knows everything about us already. Yeah. So what is it that Jesus has to keep doing in order to keep the relationship intact? He listens. He listens to us. Now you want to be sure you're paying attention and carefully considering the implications of this. Jesus, as the good shepherd, also fulfills another role. In order to fulfill this role, we have to be careful not to treat Jesus as though he is a computer with unfathomable information stored away. He's not just an algorithm. Jesus is more than the all-knowing and seemingly ever-present Google. Google does not know everything about us, though it seems to know a great deal about us. It guesses about a lot of things, and oftentimes it guesses wrong because its program can't possibly know us. But Jesus is not a program. He's not an algorithm. He's not a computer. He is a person. He is a person in the same way that you and I are persons. He knows, he feels, he acts, he makes decisions. All the things that are human about us that we kind of marvel at are present in Jesus. Now, he is using this personhood so that he can fulfill his role as our intercessor and mediator as we pray. He's listening. He hears and understands the pain that we feel as we talk about cancer, as we talk about death of loved ones, as we talk about our struggles to make ends meet. He listens to all of that. He notices your desperation. In the language of the time bells, he is doing some deep listening. He's trying to hear and understand the struggle from your perspective. We share in common problems. Many in our church are currently battling cancer or have battled cancer. But each one experiences the cancer uniquely. Each one has their own personal struggle with their cancers. It's not just a blanket sort of thing. It's not just something that an algorithm can figure out. It's Jesus as the person that listens, that hears, and responds to our pain and our sorrow. He does not base his response on other people's experience with cancer. Google looks for keywords and responds based on keywords with a certain degree of probability. But Jesus responds because he's heard you pray. He's heard you share your struggle. He's heard you uh, as you shared that emotion that undergirds that struggle. He is present with you.
So we need to do some deep listening now on our part. And listen to what Jesus is saying so that we can understand his perspective on this. So let's not listen to him as though he's just Siri or Alexa. Let's listen to him as Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus stresses that his relationship with God is characterized by an intimacy. This intimacy is the result of knowing each other exhaustively. He knows the Father, the Father knows him. This intimacy is energized by a profound love that they have for one another because of the fact they know one another. The more I come to know my wife, the more I love her. We've been married 48 years. And I'm just still learning what I can about her. Amen. Because she's a person. She changes. She has different struggles. I can't just say, well, back on January 2nd, 1976, I told you I loved you in the wedding ceremony. I have to continually tell her I love her. Amen. I have to be ready for a good answer when she asks me, do you love me? Why do you love me? I love her out of what I know about her. The Father and the Son love each other because they know each other. And it's this love that Jesus wants to give for us because the next statement he says, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is willing to die for us because of his profound, profound commitment to us. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 5 these words, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This brushstroke is a huge brushstroke. It clearly defines for us what Jesus would have us to understand about the relationship he desires. By laying down his life for us, by laying down his life for his sheep, Jesus links us as a common lump of clay to a divine destiny. We are linked to a divine destiny, though all we are is dust to dust, ashes to ashes. He knows us. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yet he loves us enough to die for us. I'm going to shut up for a moment. Because I want you to ponder, what does that mean to you? As a mere mortal, that you have become a cherished individual of a divine intelligence. Just take a moment. Think about that. Tell the Lord. Pray right now, just silently. Tell him what you're thinking. Jesus feels for you is as real as the love you have for the most significant people in your life. Remember that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are persons who created us in their image, and thus they care for us as people and not as property. The knowing comes through communication. Jesus knows and loves you because he listens to you 
as you pray. The listening is what takes the bond that was present in our being created in his image and strengthens the bond we have in this moment of time on July the 10th, 2022. On July 11th, I hope that you shared enough and in your reaction with Jesus enough that you recognize that your love tomorrow is greater than your love today. We don't want to just say, I love Jesus, and be done. Amen. We want to continue to love Him. So for that point, then we're ready for step number two, to explore why we need to listen as we pray. So there should be a picture of downtown. Ah, there it is. Uh, it didn't come out very well. Okay. This is a picture of downtown Tokyo at night. Now, you might have seen pictures like this before, that all those signs are just words. Words, 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 words. Everywhere you look, whether it's Times Square, New York, or downtown Tokyo, there's a lot of words. I, I chose this picture to be a visual presentation of what theologian Henry Nouwen says about the world in which we live in. He described it this way. Wherever we go, he says, we're surrounded by words. Words softly whispered, loudly proclaimed, angrily screamed. Words spoken, recited, or sung. Words on records, in books, on walls, or in the sky. Words in many sounds, many colors, many forms. Words to be heard, read, seen, or glanced at. Words with flicker, off and on. Words that move slowly and dance, and jump, or wiggle. Now I wrote that in 1981. That's 41 years ago. The explosion of words that he's writing about in comparison to what we have in 2022 is just a little screen. Now I use this observation to make this statement about the world in which we live. Teachers speak to students for years and the students emerge from their schooling with the feeling they're just words. Preachers preach their sermons week after week and year after year, but their parishioners remain the same and often think they're just words. Politicians, businessmen, ayatollahs, and folks give speeches, make statements, but those who listen say, they're just words. Just another distraction. This is the world in which we are trying to relate to by listening to God. It's a world of words, words, and more words. The words form the ceiling, the walls, the floor of our existence. Everywhere we turn, there are words, there are voices that are proclaiming the words. And we live now in a time, unfortunately, where communication is thought of more as a shouting match between two extreme views. Listening in this world is not valued unless it follows a particular narrative that we have chosen to follow. So how can we break free from this prison that we live in created by all these words that are constantly coming in at us? What attitude or bit of knowledge do we need that would help us listen to God? Now, if you're in a relationship with God, you already have come to know him as a person. And you know that he knows you as a person. And so what I want to do for a moment is give you that pop quiz. So there's a statement up there. When God speaks, he speaks with. So I'm looking for one word answers. Now, I'll take the hardest one. And, and put that up there and leave you the easy ones. 
Okay? To give you an idea of what I'm looking for. When God speaks, He speaks with authority. I took the hard one. Okay? Yeah. So, in a moment, I'm going to read it, shout out, and answer. Okay? Be bold. You can't, you know, you're not getting graded. Okay. So, are you ready? When God speaks, He speaks with Compassion, love, 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 wisdom, wisdom, understanding, clarity, direction, direction, peace, purpose. Wow. Love. Love. Let's sing together. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Yeah. So if we think about this for a moment, in the melee of voices, there is one voice that penetrates the hullabaloo. It is the voice of God because he speaks outside the fracas. He is not bound by the words that, you know, surround us. He lives transcendent above all this hullabaloo. And so he can speak with objectivity. The reason we need to listen to God is because he speaks with authority. He speaks with clarity. He speaks with peace. He speaks with grace. He speaks with compassion. He speaks with mercy. And it can go on and on and on. So what have we learned so far? We learn that God listens to us. We learn that we need to listen to God because His voice is the one that can pierce the clamor. And now we're ready to land the plane. Come to the so what moment. How do we go about listening? To answer that question would be another whole sermon series, and Lonnie's coming back next week, so I'm done. So I, I'm just going to give you one today. Okay? Just one thing that I want you to think about. When we pray, the most significant thing we want to remember as we pray, as we're trying to get all prayed up, is is that God is not merely an observer. Amen. He is an active participant. He is eager to speak into our lives because he is a God of compassion, a God of direction, a God who knows. He knows things. He knows people. He knows when we pray Father your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we can't just think that he's going to sit mutely on the sideline waiting for us to figure out what he's thinking Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that God has spoken throughout human history in a variety of ways he has spoken audibly he spoke audibly all through the scripture. And as I read the scripture, I never found a verse yet that said, God, stop talking. Amen. He speaks. Now, some people have heard an audible voice. Some have felt the presence in their thought lives, and they know that that thought came from God. I don't deny that those things happen. I would encourage you to actually be open to the idea that God really does have something to say to you and that listening matters. I told you last week I wasn't always a Christian. I was a Baptist first. The Baptist just came out of me. My mother and father are smiling in heaven. 
There's a series of questions that I would like for you to think about. Can you put those up, Bruce? Question number one. Oh, there we go. Do you believe? Do you believe that God is interested enough in you to listen deeply as you pray? Question number two. Do you believe that God is interested? Uh, do you believe that God has a perspective on the details of your life and he wants to speak to you about his perspective? Okay. Number three, do you believe that God can handle your honesty and listen to the depth of pain or the emptiness or the sorrow you share as you pray? If you answered yes to any of those questions or all of those questions, you have come to a point where you can understand and value the role that listening plays. We are not the only ones who listen. Hear me, friends. God is listening to you. He's not depending on, on an algorithm for eternity. He listens to his children. He knows his sheep. And his sheep know him. Let me share with you why. I've chosen this topic for today. When Lonnie comes back next week, we're going to enter into a new series in which he's going to talk about the spiritual warfare. The spiritual warfare that is probably looming on the horizon for us. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't even think Lonnie knows what it looks like. We can kind of surmise. But we will not be successful in spiritual warfare until we come to the point where we're willing to say, I will listen. It doesn't matter what you're praying if you're not going to listen to what the Father's perspective is. And he speaks through preachers, he speaks through teachers, he speaks through your family and friends, he speaks through the birds, the bees, and the flowers, and the trees. He speaks in all of nature. We just need to learn to listen. Father, right now we just pause to let you speak to us. In the quietness of this moment, speak to each one individually. Help us to discover what we need to learn to listen to you. So Father, in the quietness, we just ask you, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Help us forgive as we have been forgiven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, we commit to you. Empower us to listen. Help us to value and understand. In the name of Jesus.